There was only one way I was going to convince my scientific colleagues to at least take the idea seriously. Maybe not convince that I'm right, but, but take the idea seriously, and that was to use evolution by natural selection. If I could show that evolution by natural selection does not favor organisms that see reality as it is, then I would get their attention. I remember a sense of detachment and falling apart, you know, coldness. And then I was back, drowsy and disoriented, but, but definitely there. Now, when you wake from a deep sleep, you might feel confused about the time or anxious about oversleeping, but there's always a basic sense of time having passed, of a continuity between then and now. And coming around from anesthesia is very different. I could have been under for five minutes, five hours, five years, or even 50 years. I simply wasn't there. It was total oblivion. Anesthesia, it's a modern kind of magic. It turns people into objects, and then we hope back again into people. And in this process is one of the greatest remaining mysteries in science and philosophy. How does consciousness happen? Somehow, within each of our brains, the combined activity of many billions of neurons, each one a tiny biological machine, is generating a conscious experience. And not just any conscious experience, your conscious experience. It's about who we are, and I can't help but be curious. The mystery is this. What is the relationship between your brain and your conscious experiences, such as your experience of the taste of chocolate or the feeling of velvet? Now, this mystery is not new. In 1868, Thomas Huxley wrote, how it is that anything so remarkable as a state of consciousness comes about as the result of irritating nervous tissue is just as unaccountable as the appearance of the genie when Aladdin rubbed his lamp. Now Huxley knew that brain activity and conscious experiences are correlated, but he didn't know why. To the science of his day, it was a mystery. In the years since Huxley, science has learned a lot about brain activity, but the relationship between brain activity and conscious experiences is still a mystery. Why? Why have we made so little progress? Well, some experts think that we can't solve this problem because we lack the necessary concepts and intelligence. We don't expect monkeys to solve problems in quantum mechanics, and as it happens, we can't expect our species to solve this problem either. Well, I disagree. I'm more optimistic. I think we've simply made a false assumption. Once we fix it, we just might solve this problem. Today, I'd like to tell you what that assumption is, why it's false, and how to fix it. Reality is more like a 3D desktop that's designed to hide the complexity of the real world and guide adaptive behavior. Space, as you perceive it, is your desktop. Physical objects are just the icons in that desktop. We used to think that the Earth is flat because it looks that way. Then we thought that the Earth is the unmoving center of reality because it looks that way. We were wrong. We had misinterpreted our perceptions. Now we believe that space, time, and objects are the nature of reality as it is. The theory of evolution is telling us that once again, we're wrong. We're misinterpreting the content of our perceptual experiences. There's something that exists when you don't look, but it's not space, time, and physical objects. What you've kind of proposed, and again, we, we may be wrong here, but it's the one thing that's actually felt right to me about the nature of reality, that we don't see it as it actually is. Right. In other words, we don't see truth. 
we see a graphical user interface that is a series of icons that are tuned to keep us alive and reproducing, but not tuned to show us the truth. And the underlying truth that is there may be much more interesting than we think. So yes. let's start with that. How did you even get interested in studying this? Well, I was interested in perception and artificial intelligence and the question, are we machines? Are people <laughs> just machines or is there something more to us than just machines? And, and so I was, as a teenager, I was very interested in these questions. I was programming, so I knew what programs could do a bit. And, but I was also, you know, my dad was a fundamentalist minister, so there were all these other aspects of his spirituality or, or religion that were interesting about human nature. And I was trying to put all this stuff together. So I, I would, on the one side with programming and, and the new kinds of capacities of artificial intelligence, it was looking like we might be machines. On the other hand, there's supposed to be something about us that's beyond the machine. And so I was very, very curious. And so I started... I went to UCLA and did an undergraduate degree in which I was studying computer science, mathematics, with a major in psychology. And then I went to MIT, where I went to the Artificial Intelligence Laboratory and what's now the Brain and Cognitive Science Department. And so I was able to then study both the brain and cognitive sciences aspect of, of human nature and the artificial intelligence kinds of models of, of intelligence, trying to put together a picture of, of who we are, what is human nature, what, what are we? Are we just machines? Are we just biological machines? Are we just computers? Or is there something beyond the space-time physical machine? And I wasn't sure, but I kept pursuing the mathematical models. And in 1986, my collaborators and I actually had a mathematical model. And studying it, talking with my collaborators, I realized that the mathematics was saying to me, what you are seeing may not be the truth. And I still remember the moment when I realized what the math was saying. I wasn't trying to get there with the math. It was just, I was just trying to get a general theory of perception mathematically. And when I realized the math was saying, you don't necessarily see the truth, I had to sit down. It was such a shock to the system. And so that was 1986, that was 33 years ago. I've been now following that thread for 33 years and seeing where it takes me. And it's pretty interesting, okay? Where you were saying, you know, it was about not seeing the truth. And I went, I watched it and I said, oh, here's a scientist. So this is an interesting visual perception and how we don't really see things as they are. They're constructions of our mind. And not only that, but they're not even close to reality. They are purely iconic to help us survive, and we're not seeing the underlying reality at all. And you present this really interesting case, and I remember yes. having this moment, it was a red pill moment, right. where mm -hmm. right towards the end, I was like, I was just riveted, and at the end I said, oh my gosh, so what is reality? And you just said, I have a couple theories of what the world actually is, but we'll get to that another time or something like that. And I was like, right. no. So then I went down the Don Hoffman rabbit hole and watched a lot of your lectures on what the theory is. So maybe we should back up and go, mm -hmm. you know, you study visual perception. Why is it that you're saying, and in this book, The Case Against Reality, you, you actually do this. You build a case chapter by chapter by chapter, starting with things like split brain experiments. Like how is it that you can cleave conscious experience in two? Right. Um, all the way up to how you know insects can go extinct by trying to have sex with a beer bottle because right. it <clears throat> fools their system into thinking that's a female, right. and all the way into quantum mechanics, general relativity, <clears throat> up to, okay, everything we see is not what's actually happening. Can Take us on this ride a little bit in the way you describe it. Right, and, and also the reason why I take this ride, um, I actually, published a book in 1998 called Visual Intelligence in which I actually put out the idea that this is all just a user interface. So the book... In 88? In, uh, 98. 98, 1998. yeah. 1998. And in that book, the first nine chapters are sort of standard um, modern cognitive sciences approaches to visual perception. But in the last chapter, I go after this idea that we're seeing just an interface, not, not the truth. And my colleagues use the book as a textbook in various universities and so forth. They like the book, except that last chapter, they go, you know, Hoffman goes off the rails on the last chapter. <laughs> and, and I realized that there was only one way I was going to convince my scientific colleagues to at least take the idea seriously. Maybe not convince that I'm right, but, but take the idea seriously. And that was to use evolution by natural selection. If I could show 
that evolution by natural selection does not favor organisms that see reality as it is, then I would get their attention. And I thought immediately that maybe it would be because it, the truth is too complicated, it would take too much time and energy. Right. And it turns out that that's correct, but it's not the real deep, interesting reason. And it, so as I explored evolution by natural selection, I realized there was a deeper reason that I'd never understood before. And the reason is this, that that fitness payoffs, which are like, it, evolution is like a video game. In a video game, you have to go running around in the screen as quickly as you can, grabbing points to try to get enough points to get to the next level. If you do, you get to the next level. If you don't, you die. In evolution, you're grabbing what they call fitness payoffs, but they're like the game points. And, you know, grabbing fitness payoffs that, you know, to food, the right mates, and so forth. But if you get enough, you don't yourself go to the next level. It's your genes that go to the next level in your offspring. And what I realized as I started studying this with my, my graduate students, um, Justin Mark and Brian Marion, we discovered that what's really going on is that the fitness payoffs themselves, which is what we're going to be tracking, that's what our senses are going to be telling us about. It turns out that the fitness payoffs themselves, in general, do not carry information about objective reality. They just tell you, you're about to die, you're about to get something that you're, you're good, you're bad, don't eat this, eat that. Have sex with this, don't have sex with that. Right. That's all they're telling you. They're not telling you about the truth. And I can say that more mathematically, they're not homomorphisms of reality. I mean, so for mathematicians, generically, fitness payoff functions are not homomorphisms of structures and objective reality. But, but intuitively, it's just that fitness payoffs um, aren't about the truth. They're about what you need to do to stay alive. And that, that secured it for me. That, that was... That was a surprise to me that I learned around 2008, 2009, that evolution was even further against seeing the truth than I'd ever imagined. When I actually go give talks at universities and conferences, um, I present the mathematical model and that raises the level of the conversation. If I didn't have that, I'm sure I would be dismissed without, without you know, further ado. Um, but with the mathematics, then they have to take it quite seriously. So, so my burden then is different from the burden of the neuroscientists who t say that brain causes consciousness. They have to show how the brain and, or activities of the brain or properties of neurons or loops of activity cause consciousness without a hand wave and they can't do that. My burden is to start with consciousness and without any hand waves get first all of physics. So I need to get um, you know classical relativity theory, I need to get quantum theory, and I need to get relativistic quantum theory as a starting point and then hopefully uh, an understanding of what how neurobiology arises out of it. So for me what I have to do is first say what I mean by consciousness. So I have to have a mathematical model and I've, I've pr presented one at this conference that I call Conscious Agent. And it's a very simple, and for a mathematician, my structure is actually quite simple. It's just three probability spaces, three um, maps between those spaces, technically Markovian kernels, and then just one counter that, count, that counts the number of experiences that you've had. It's a very, very simple mathematical structure. So I propose that that captures that plus then all the combinatorics, right? that you can get by interacting different conscious agents together um, gives me a complete model for consciousness. So it's an empirical claim. And the, the claim is what I call the, the conscious agent thesis, that every aspect of consciousness can be represented as some system of interacting conscious agents. That's the claim.
So the idea really that you're advancing, if reality is a creative construct, then does that mean that physical objects are hallucinations? I mean, Maria's already distinguished between the ones that are, the hallucinations that are, and then things that aren't actually hallucinations. Are you arguing then that everything that we think is an object before us is actually a construction? That's a great question. So, so the idea is first that space-time itself is not the pre-existing stage on which the drama of life plays out. It's a data structure that you create when you open your eyes. You are the author of space and time. You're not just a little entity stuck inside of space and time. You create it. Now, the difference between illusions, perceptions that are illusory versus non-illusory, the standard definition is something is illusory if it doesn't correspond to reality, and it's ver veridical or true if it corresponds to reality. I give a different definition. Something is illusory, this is now an evolutionary definition. My perception of an object is illusory if it does not guide adaptive action. And it's truthful if it guides adaptive action.